Everywhere you look, in Hebrew and Greek copies of scripture, both handwritten and printed, there is minor textual variation and macro-level continuity and stability. Everywhere you look in translations, in all the many languages in which God's Word has been placed, something that I find almost no one doing on either side of debates about the Bible's text and translation, you see the same thing. Minor translational variation, but macro-level continuity and stability. I take a view that I call textual confidence, even though God has given us no warrant for textual absolutism. In other words, let me explain why I am still a strong biblical inerrantist, despite acknowledging that I don't have a perfect copy of the Greek New Testament or of the Hebrew Bible, or a perfect translation of either one. In a previous video, I showed five places where the underlying text of the standard Dutch Bible, the Staatenvertelung of 1637, differ from that of the King James Version. And I've come to the Taj Mahal, actually, which is not a normal place for me to do videos to explain this to you. But this is the, uh, this is the trip that I'm taking with my church. And it's an appropriate place to talk about world languages and the way the Bible differs in very, very minor translational ways and textual ways in Bible translations around the world. The differences between the Staatenvertelung and the King James Version, for example, were very minor, but they're very clear and translatable. I talked about one that uh, involves the name of Jesus. I didn't demonstrate this further point, but I know it to be the case. Other major world translations, even from the time before Westcott and Hort's critical text of the Greek New Testament was released in 1881, they show the same kind of minor textual variation. In this video, however, at the Taj Mahal, I plan to talk about minor translational variation, the kind of translational variation that occurs in Bibles around the world. In India, the land of Sanskrit, it's a great place to talk about the fascinating linguistic stuff happening all around, and I think the Taj Mahal is a great place to talk about minor variation around the world. Textual absolutists are usually absolute about both text and translation. They claim to have a perfect copy of the Hebrew Bible and of the Greek New Testament. They claim to have certainty of the words, but they also resist any attempt to revise the King James itself as a translation. So King James defenders often explain every translation decision made by the King James translators as correct and not subject to revision. Those who do not do so are not textual absolutists when it comes to translation. I recognize that such brothers do exist. Even the language that the King James translators used, early modern English, simply cannot be improved upon in their view. I'm told frequently by King James and Textus Receptus defenders that modern English is just too dumbed down. It can't convey the words of God with accuracy like the King James does. I heard this two days ago in a phone conversation with a well-known King James only leader that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later. And I think the three fascinating tools that I'm going to talk about in this video will provide a helpful God-given shakeup to anybody who has an English only or an Elizabethan English only perspective. Because when you look around the world, you find that minor translational variation is the norm among Bibles at the micro level. At that micro level, they don't say the same thing in every last place, though at the macro level, they absolutely do. I'm actually standing on the top of a Christian conference center in the amazing Hyderabad, India, just surrounded by all kinds of amazing sights and smells and cultural things that I don't fully understand. I'm here with a church leadership of mine, and this is where you're going to get the second segment of this video. Let's start again with the Staatenvertelung, the Dutch equivalent of the King James Version. Turn in your Dutch Bibles to Daniel 3.25, if you would, and while you turn, a missionary friend of mine told me after my last video that the Staatenvertelung is not used by his conservative group of Christians. They have a more recent revision, basically the uh, revision of the Staatenvertelung. And after that same video, another friend of mine suggested that I should have made something explicit that I left implicit. The King James Only World, when asked, consistently throws their weight behind the 1637 Staatenvertelung. 
as the right Bible for the Dutch, no matter what conservative Christians there now are using. One need look no further than the major King James-only organization, the Trinitarian Bible Society. They actually sell the 1637 Stottenberg Ling. It's put out actually by a sister organization in the Netherlands that kind of lands in the King James-only world, uses similar arguments for the Stottenberg Ling. I also asked in a Facebook group that is frequented by mainstream King James-only, I sent a couple extremists, and they affirmed what I expected. The 1637 Stottenvertling is the right Bible for the Dutch people. Only one extremist there recommended that the Dutch translate the King James into Dutch. So, Daniel 3.25. This verse is one frequently mentioned by King James defenders as a signal example of the corruption of contemporary Bibles. King James only is Thomas Ross, for example, who is debating James White soon says after his discussion of this verse that the modern versions are in error and that the modern Bible versions are shown to be inferior and corrupt by contrast with the King James here at Daniel 3.25. This passage comes at the moment when Nebuchadnezzar tosses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace for failing to worship his image. But someone appears with these faithful Jews in the fire. And this is the way it reads in the King James Version. Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That's Daniel 3.25, of course, in the King James Version. And yet, this is the way it reads in the great majority of modern versions. Listen to this. I'll read the New King James. I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. In the King James, Nebuchadnezzar appears to see a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, and he somehow knows it. He even capitalizes Son of God, both Son and God. Are the modern versions nixing Jesus? No, of course they're not. This is one of the few Aramaic sections of the Old Testament, and though it is possible that the King James is right here, it's simply unlikely. The word is plural in Aramaic, gods, not God. Unlike in Hebrew, where the plural form of God, Elohim, is often clearly singular in meaning, referring to the one God, we don't have clear instances of this happening with this plural Aramaic form of the word God. I wouldn't go so far as to say that the King James committed an error, but they did pick the minority interpretation of a passage that has been discussed for many centuries. And now to the Dutch Stottenvertling. How did they take this passage? Did they side with the King James Version translators or with the modern versions? In 1637, well, see for yourself, as I mangle the Dutch. He on Vortede and Seide. Well, you can actually hear the English here, because uh, Dutch is the long-lost Germanic cousin of English. It, they said, he answered and said, Zie ik zie veel mannen. See, I see four men. Los Wanderlande in het midden des Wils, unbound in the midst of the fires. It's funny again, how the Dutch sounds like English that's spoken through a foam mattress or something, though I'm sure that's the way we sound to them too and er es gehen verdif an hen, and they are not hurt, and de gedante des verden, and the appearance of the fourth, is gleich in suns golden, is like sons of the gods. You can hear it clearly through the mattress. There's a footnote that I'll show you uh, now too that acknowledges the long-standing interpretive option which sees this as a reference to Jesus. It says, in Dutch of course, though I'll translate it to English for you, some think that it was the Lord Christ himself who appeared to these young men. But it also points out that Nebuchadnezzar, just a few verses later, calls this figure an angel. This is in the Stottenvertling footnotes, which is another reason not to take verse 25 as a confession of Nebuchadnezzar seeing Jesus. Again, the King James Version is not clearly wrong, but neither certainly is the Dutch translation, the main historic Dutch Bible used by Dutch Christians and recommended by King James Onlyists. I don't think any doctrine rides on this decision. God miraculously saved his three servants, whether he sent his son or an angel or came himself as the angel of the Lord, which sometimes happens. No matter how he saved them, he saved them. But because of inspired ambiguities like this, points at which God gave us a text that can be legitimately translated in one of two distinctly different ways, there is here a minor translational variation but macro level continuity and stability between the King James and the Stottenvertling. Only if the Bible's words are magic does this minor difference matter. Only if God's words don't have to enter your understanding to change and instruct you, but just need to be repeated like incantations 
does this difference matter? Only if God's words are like Harry Potter spells, in other words, which have to be pronounced just right when Guardian Leviosa, you know, or they don't work. Only if that's the case does this difference matter. God gave his Dutch believers for centuries a Bible translation that said something slightly different than Daniel 3.25 in the Bible he gave his English-speaking believers in England and elsewhere. Their translation in the Netherlands was legitimate, as was ours, and that needs to be okay with you. Because whate'er my God ordains is right, holy his will abideth. I don't know about you, but I will be still whate'er he does and follow where he guideth. That was a long first point. The next two points will be quicker, I promise, and maybe if I'm lucky and you're not, those points will get their own videos and not too long. They deserve attention. Both of these points are amazingly cool things that I did not create. First is TIPS, T-I-P-S, which stands for Translation Insights and Perspectives. This is an amazing and free Bible study resource that you can find for yourself at tips.translation.bible. TIPS is a project spearheaded by one of the big name guys in the Bible translation world, Joost Zesch. I believe I could explore this site for hours. It is so rich. Let me explain a little about the project before I show a place of minor translational variation among world Bibles. I have many friends who are Bible translators around the world. Dr. Troy Manning, who is a leader at Bibles International, used to be the leader of the Kids Evangelistic Bible Club that I served in every Saturday for, I guess, about two years. A number of the consultants, translation consultants under him, are respected friends of mine, one of whom, whose name I cannot give, although I can tell you that she used to be my boss when I was a graphic designer for the BJU Campus Store. She's in India, as I am now, serving in a language she can't tell me. And I love to read her prayer letters because she often includes little tidbits about Bible translation, little insights that you get into God's Word when you're forced to ask all the minute questions that come up when you're translating uh, the ancient texts of Scripture into modern languages that might not have no relationship to them. This is an example that does not come from my friend, but the way one translation that comes from the northern Philippines, Kalinga, translates believe is with the word manutua. A consultant working on the Kalinga Bible Project said that manutua the word the Kalinga translators chose for believe goes back to the word for truth, which is tutua. When used as a verb, this term is commonly used to, to mean believe as well as obey. And that's just really cool. Their word for believe in Kalinga has the word for truth in it. And actually similar to the uh, Greek word for trust, their word for believe can also mean obey. Where did I get this example? It's not from one of my many Bible translator friends. It's from TIPS, T-I-P-S. And TIPS is just chock full of stuff like this. This is a fantastic website for monolingual people to spend some time in. Let's do some mutatis mutandis, some vice versa. And imagine that we're over in the northern Philippines trying to complain to the Kalinga Janata version only Christians that while their Kalinga translation is excellent and trustworthy, we'd like to have the freedom to read ours without their condemnation. What if one of them, the Kalinga version only Christian, said to you, I read your corrupt English Bible and I see that your word for believe does not include the word for truth. This is not accurate. Kalinga is a better vessel for communicating God's word than English is, clearly. Here we go again with minor variation among translations. We have to accept it. Now I just want to demonstrate one more minor place of minor variation among world Bible translations. And I decided to stay in Daniel 3 for this one. In Daniel 3.24, in the Jarai language of Cambodia, where one of my most respected and brilliant friends of long standing has given his life to translate scripture. The grammar of Jirai requires that the word we specify whether the speaker includes the addressee or not. 
and I borrowed this from the TIPS website for an explanation. The inclusive we specifically includes the addressee, the person you're talking to. It means you and I and possibly others. While the exclusive we specifically excludes the addressee, addressee and therefore means he, she, they, and I, but not you. This grammatical distinction is called clusivity. In other words, it's either inclusive or exclusive of the person to whom you're speaking. While Semitic languages such as Hebrew or most Indo-European languages such as Greek or English do not make this distinction, translators of languages like Jirai that have this distinction have to make this choice every time they encounter the word we or a form thereof. Now let me read Daniel 3.24, which I'll read in the King James Version. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? That's Daniel 3.24 in the King James Version. And this is a place of minor variation. I looked at the TIPS website and it helped me see that English can leave the exact extent of Nebuchadnezzar's we unspecified, just like the Aramaic here does. Daniel 3 is written in Aramaic. But Jirai Christians read a Bible that has to make a choice of clusivity. In essence, it has to add meaning that's not included in the original Ar Aramaic. Either Nebuchadnezzar meant you and I and possibly others flew through these men into the fire, or he meant he, she, they, and I, but not you threw these men into the fire. Translators of Jirai have to choose an option. It's required by the language. And it is therefore a place of minor translational variation among world Bibles. I hope to spend more time on this tip site in future videos for your benefit, but I urge you to check it out for yourself. Third, we've gone to the Netherlands, we've gone to the Philippines, then to Cambodia, and I myself right now am standing in India in Hyderabad. Let's land in our own backyard in American English with another online tool that's just stupendous and that has been deserving its own video for a long time. It's expandedbible.com. I encounter somewhat regularly Christians who, for some good reason, haven't spent any time thinking about Bible translation. Christians for whom debates about translation are overwhelming. What's so difficult, they seem to think. Why can't you just translate from one language to another, word for word? Why do we have to have debates about this? They just don't have any concept of the countless minor decisions that go into translation, or the way in which God's inspired word can contain minor ambiguities. They've never translated anything. How could they know? A great way for people like this to learn is expandedbible.com. It shows places of possible minor variation among Bible translations. It gives legitimate English options at multiple places. Options that I think will be intuitively understandable, even to people who have never translated anything. For example, the chapter that comes up when you open up the site is John chapter 3. Should you say, one night Nicodemus came to Jesus, or by night Nicodemus came to Jesus? The Greek allows for both. Both are accurate. And therefore, it's an option on expandedbible.com. And if it's an option, then you should assume that it's an option that serious people could choose. Which would you choose? Or would you have Nicodemus call Jesus a rabbi or a teacher? Both are justifiable. The New Testament itself says that rabbi, actually rabboni, means teacher. Or do you call the works of Jesus signs or miracles? Both are justifiable. Both are accurate. The King James itself translates this word signs about two-thirds of the time and miracles about one-third. It also uses miracles and tokens. And do you translate the meaning or the form of verily, verily, I say to you? And does Jesus call for people to be born again or born from above? The Greek is decidedly, purposefully ambiguous. So which do you choose? Just go through one chapter like this, John chapter 3, and you will learn a good deal, I promise. Even if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, you'll get more of a feel for why minor translational variation exists among Bibles around the world. And hopefully you will be at peace with this fact. It won't upset you. You'll trust, you'll trust the Lord about it. He is able to get his truth across to people in languages that you have never thought of. Languages that he can speak perfectly. Languages that he invented and evolved. I recently heard Joost Zetsch say in an interview that every language is perfect to its speakers. It can say everything they need it to say. 
And I just loved this. It inflamed my imagination. We think of our language, I mean English, as superior to others because it has so many accoutrements, like the pretty Frenchified word accoutrements. English has dictionaries, it has college majors, it has a written canon, it has grammars, it has tons and tons of literature and linguistic corpuses, and frankly, many millions of highly educated speakers. Talk pisin in Papua New Guinea has very little of this, but talk pisin can carry the words of God to the people of God, even if you and I have our doubts. Two more little stories to round out this video. First, I did a report for school once on the Baptist General Conference, a denomination that began as an immigrant church in America, essentially the Swedish Baptists. Little did I know that I would one day actually attend a church that was technically but only vestigially connected to that denomination. Interesting tidbit there. And I'll never forget one of the anecdotes that I came across in my work on that little report for school as the Swedish Baptists hit that inevitable point that all immigrant churches hit, the point where the third generation is losing its grip on their mother tongue, they debated having their services in English. There was an old Swedish Christian lady who stood up and made this argument, in Swedish of course, you never heard of anyone being converted in English. We chuckle, this is so obviously provincial, it's parochial, it's limited, it's really, to use a blunter word, it's ignorant. She doesn't know the truth. It's totally excusable ignorance for a pre-internet era old woman who'd only ever known Swedish-speaking Christians. And it appears to have done no harm. The denomination went on to continue to exist. She was overruled by wiser heads. But what about when ignorance is not excusable? When it exists among people who have every opportunity and reason to know better? And when it is doing great harm? King James onlyism and other forms of textual absolutism are not victimless crimes. Missionaries call me from the field, unsure what to do, after their exposure to Christians who speak another world language like Telugu around here, kills their King James onlyism. They see this minor textual variation and translational variation, and it conflict, conflicts with the claims they've been given that perfect translation is easy. A little experience kills that. And yet, concluding story number two. I had a cordial, hour-long conversation with a leading King James Onlyist that many of my viewers would know from Twitter. He has a very combative and pugnacious public persona. He even told me that his own wife thinks he needs to tone it down. But he reached out to me with questions that he wanted to ask. And to me, he was humble, straightforward, and willing to listen. Each of us talked for about the same amount of time during the video conversation that we had, something that I really notice and appreciate. And though he explicitly rejected Ruckmanism and called it extreme, he adopted one of the key beliefs of Ruckmanism, namely that God's apparent blessing on the English-speaking church conveys a concomitant blessing on our English Bible. This brother, and I believe he is a brother in Christ, argued that God used the Greek for a good while and gave them a perfect Bible, but then because of their sin, he took away their, uh, his blessing on them and he put that blessing on English speakers, giving us a perfect Bible. We're about to lose that blessing ourselves because of our sin, he said. I hope I'm representing him accurately. And, and he said God will likely have to give this other language a perfect Bible, whoever he's gonna bless next. He gave me an example of a King James word that is so accurate that it just can't be updated, concupiscence. He happened to be simply and clearly wrong in that instance, and he listened patiently as I explained, he really did. But he was also wrong about the overall point that I'm making in my concluding stories to this long video. God can speak any language if, as this man admitted, very few people know the word concupiscence. Contemporary English will have some other word or words that can convey the necessary ideas. This may mean that there is therefore minor translational variation among different languages, which convey the sense of Romans 7, 8 just a little bit differently. But God is not shackled by his creations. He is free, he is Lord of these creations. Whatever your language is, God can speak it. And whatever your language is, don't forget that there are many millions in the Ninevehs around the world who don't know a lick of your language and would have no idea if you thought God loved your language most. I'm in Hyderabad, India, as I mentioned, and we've passed miles and miles and miles of these tiny little shops, every one of which has a person in it, almost always a man, 
and there are often several men milling around out front, some people shopping in the store. There are certainly women walking around, and it was just overwhelming, the number of people and how busy they were, all zipping past me on their motorbikes and in their tuk-tuks or whatever those little uh, vehicles are called. And I thought so much about Jonah 411. Should I not have pity on this great city, something like this, God says, because there are so many people in it who don't know their right hand from their left, and much cattle, which is totally appropriate for India because you see cattle all over the place. The people here in Hyderabad who speak Telugu, and I got to speak a little bit of Telugu and a little bit of Hindi while I was here, they have no idea that you think, if you think, English is God's specially blessed language, that God loves your language most. One of my key supporters and prayer warriors and counselors, somebody who regularly uh, tells me that he's praying for me, which I really appreciate, and somebody who regularly reminds me to be gracious to others online, which I also really appreciate. Shout out to Evan Steele. He's given me good counsel in the past. He said to me recently something I thought was so profound. If your theology does not hold up around the globe, like in Hyderabad, it's not theology, it's culture. God is not a respecter of cultures. So why do Bibles around the world differ slightly in minor particulars? Because God, for his own purposes, has left some textual and translational decisions to people without giving them Urim and Thummim to help them determine which one he would choose. I know God is good. I believe that it is for our good and for his glory that he has given minor translational variation to his people in different cultures. Minor translational variation and macro level continuity and stability.